Applaudissez-moi, applaudissez-moi. J'ai rien fait de majeur, mais faites-le. Bien mangé? Public en délire, es-tu en délire? Oui. J'ai rien compris. Public en délire, es-tu en délire? Oui. Ah, ça, c'est mieux. Il euh, y a quelqu'un qui me demandait, mais comment on peut communiquer avec la gang du WAC sur le Slack ou sur Slack? Je sais pas comment vous appelez ça. En tout cas, slack.webaquebec.org. Point .com, hein? euh, fait que slack.webaquebec.org. On vous rappelle que c'est primordial, euh, fondamental que vous évaluiez, euh, que vous faites, que vous fassiez, faisiez l'évaluation des conférences. Fait que allez sur le site web, dans la zone programmation, vous allez chercher les conférences euh, que vous avez vues, puis au bas des descriptions, vous avez une dizaine d'étoiles que vous pouvez euh, remplir à coup d'index. C'est très simple, faites-le, puis pour nous, c'est euh, des données très, très euh, importantes. Euh, on m'a posé la question aussi, euh, paraît-il que les, euh, les, les conférences sous forme de diapositives seraient disponibles? Mais quand, mais où et comment? Allez, réponds-nous. Euh, ça, ça va se faire, pas en fin de semaine, mais dans les semaines suivantes. Dans le fond, c'est le temps que l'organisation euh, réécrive à tous les conférenciers pour leur dire « Salut, peux-tu nous envoyer ta version finale? » Ils vont mettre ça sur une affaire, là, un « SharePoint ». Ça a l'air d'être une plaque tournante de l'information, fait que vous allez aller là-dessus et les conférences seront disponibles visuellement statiques, OK? Fait que euh, vous pourrez en profiter de cette manière-là. Et il euh, y a un concours pour euh, t'envoler vers San Francisco. Je ne sais pas si tu le savais. Présentement, oui, oui. Il euh, faut se rendre sur la page Facebook de Cortex, euh, partenaire euh, principal euh, de, du WAC. Euh, si ça tente de manger des toasts à l'avocat en contemplant le Golden Gate, il ben, faut que tu ailles sur leur page Facebook remplir euh, le, leur petite zone de concours. Puis, euh, tu as jusqu'à minuit ce soir pour participer, puis tu pourrais te ramasser euh, là-bas. C'est pas plate. Hein? Fait que, faisons ça. Euh, puis, 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 je regarde de loin, je regarde de proche, et c'est la même information. Donc, je suis rendu à vous présenter. Bon, c'est jamais des fois, on, le focus se fait puis on voit de la nouvelle info. Euh, mais non, j'ai tout dit ce que j'avais à dire. Maintenant, je vous présente notre prochaine conférencière. Euh, elle est chercheuse en bioinformatique à l'Institut Curie de Paris. Euh, elle était encore sur les bancs d'école quand a été publié le premier séquençage du génome humain, euh, puis qu'on a été témoin de l'avènement du domaine de la génomique. Euh, chercheuse en sciences expérimentales, elle cherche à donner vie aux données biologiques euh, du décodage des euh, mutations cancéreuses à l'encodage de données sûres de l'ADN. Euh, elle a fait un TED Talk dernièrement qui vient tout juste, euh, je pense hier ou avant hier, de dépasser le million de vues. Euh, ce, et c'est de, de ce de quoi elle va nous parler euh, aujourd'hui. C'est l'avenir du stockage euh, des données grâce à l'utilisation du plus vieux support de stockage au monde, soit l'ADN. Et euh, fun fact, c'était son anniversaire il y a deux jours. Merci d'accueillir très chaleureusement Dina Zielinski. Hello, bonjour. Thank you for the very chilly welcome here in Quebec. It was certainly fun to uh, celebrate here with some of you for my birthday two days ago, and I was happy to be here. So I'm going to talk to you guys today about uh, storing data in DNA. So I'm a bioinformatician. I work with DNA sequencing, uh, which basically means I get to, if I'm feeling cheeky, I tell people that I reformat incredibly large text files for a living. To give you an idea what that looks like, that's because I work with files that look like this. Most of these files have tens of millions of lines. So most of the time, I'm just trying to wrangle them into different formats so that we can actually interpret the data. A big part of my job is also trying to make sure I don't take up the whole server with all of the data that we're generating. So I get weekly email reminders that I have to delete uh, or purge some of my, my directories on the Institute Curie server. On a more relatable note, we humans generate a lot of data. To give you an idea, here are some uh, statistics for how much data is generated by the minute on YouTube, Instagram, Netflix, LinkedIn, emails, Twitter. It's a lot of data by the minute. 
we don't really think about where this data is being stored uh, or how it's being accessed. We, we often just think about maybe, oh, it's in the cloud. It's in this mystical place called the cloud. But what does it actually mean to store something in the cloud? It's not just up there floating around uh, freely. Of course, this, this comes at a cost. We have to pay to store the data. And they're often in these giant server farms that require tons of electricity that costs an absurd amount of money uh, to store and to run. So we're actually running out of space to store all of the data, given all of the man-made devices that are available today. And it's not very clear that we're actually going to be able to keep up with this deluge of data because most of the digital data has been generated in the last two years alone. And so by 2020, it's estimated that the world's digital data will total more than 40 zettabytes. Now, since I'll be talking a lot about bits and bytes, here's just a very quick refresher. Of the, you know, I have to consult this myself when I'm trying to think about the scale of the data. And so we're really entering this uh, zettabyte age, which is crazy. We're kind of running out of bytes here. We're going to have to expand our vocabulary. So I can't not talk about the fact that the first ever photo of a black hole was published yesterday. It's pretty cool timing, actually. And while I was procrastinating on finishing my talk, I came across this tweet showing the PhD student at MIT who was responsible for developing the algorithm that actually pieced together all the photos to create that first image of a black hole. And I thought it was pretty cool that they put it next to the computer science Margaret Hamilton, who was responsible for helping to put a man on the moon. And now, luckily, we've moved away from punch cards, and we uh, have come up with more robust, uh, more dense data storage methods. But as you can see, it's still an absurd volume of data. In fact, they generated about five petabytes, and they ended up having to ship these hard drives rather than trying to send it via the internet. So they actually shipped these hard drives to MIT and Max Planck in Germany. In 2019, we're still shipping hard drives because that's the best way to send data. So this reminded me of this photo. Some of you might remember from the early 90s of Bill Gates showing the, the um, equivalent amount of data that would fit on paper that would then also fit onto a single CD-ROM. So, can't not mention Bill Gates, little nerdy goofball. <laughs> the point is here, though, that we've come a pretty long way in developing uh, new storage solutions. And most of recorded history uh, recently has been digital. We don't really have stone tablets anymore, so we really need a way to save our data. And the problem with all of these devices is many of you have probably used a floppy disk, many of you have probably lost important school reports on them, and some of you may not have ever used a floppy disk, which makes me feel really old. <laughs> <laughs> So the point is, a lot of these storage devices very quickly become obsolete. We might be able to repurpose them, but their original use is, is no, no longer applicable. We can no longer rely on these uh, flimsy man-made devices. I mean, even if you had one of these, what are the chances that anyone would actually have a, a reader to actually read the data off of it? So I also recently learned that there's a real struggle to store all of the films in Hollywood. Now, this is the, the mecca of, of films, and they're struggling to find the funding because they have to update the tapes that store these films every five to ten years. And it turns out that it costs millions of dollars because these magnetic tapes, which is what we really s still continue to store archival data on, they have to be updated constantly, and they're costly to maintain, and these film archivists actually don't even have a way 
to, uh, to afford to back up these important videos, some of which even include uh, stories from Holocaust survivors. So, turns out there is a solution, and it's quite obvious, given that it's in the title of my talk, but DNA actually is one of the most robust storage architectures in existence, and it's certainly much more robust and durable than any of these flimsy man-made uh, technologies. Now, before I describe how we actually store data in DNA um, and some of the work that we did in the lab, I want to give you an idea of the scale of how much data DNA can actually store. So, for those of you who don't quite remember high school biology, uh, DNA consists of an alphabet of four letters, nucleotides, A, T, C, and G. Every human has six billion of these base pairs, so six billion A's, T's, C's, and G's. Now, if I were to take your individual genome, just one person, and print it out in standard size 12 font on standard uh, A4 paper, it would reach somewhere between the height of the Washington Monument and the Statue of Liberty. Sorry, I didn't know any tall Canadian monuments. <laughs> But you get the idea. It's, it's a lot of data. The thing is, that's in just one of your cells. We actually have more than 30 trillion cells in our body, of just human cells, never mind bacteria. And so this totals to about 1.5 gigabytes per cell in your body. So we've come a really long way at creating and compressing and storing information. But man-made devices are really primitive achievements compared to nature. Nature has optimized DNA to store data over billions of years. And actually, humanity's total storage capacity amounts to less than 1% of the information that's stored in a single person's DNA. So really, DNA is the ultimate storage architecture. And it turns out that Every living thing is a DNA storage device. Some maybe a little more corrupt than others. <laughs> I have to say it. If I don't laugh, I'll cry. <laughs> and so one thing I want to just get out in the open here, since it's one of the most commonly asked questions, is, okay, so when can, we, can I store my family photos in my DNA? Uh, so I just want to make clear that we're storing the data in synthetic DNA. So chemically printed DNA that you, anyone, can actually order from a company. Uh, and one of the most common companies is out in San Francisco. You can literally just send them a file and anyone can order synthetic DNA. So there's no plan to create literal thumb drives. Uh, this was actually from a Reddit, Ask Me Anything, after our study was published. I have to say it was sometimes frightening, but mostly entertaining. So that being said, we actually can recover uh, DNA from, from ancient humans. Of course, we're not storing the data in these humans. But many of you might have heard of Utsi the Iceman. I think I might have learned about him in social studies in high school or something. Or um, maybe a little bit later. <laughs> but Utsi the Iceman was found preserved in the Alps between Austria and Italy. And it turns out that they were able to uh, basically sequence remaining DNA on Utsi, and they found that he had living relatives in Austria today. And so they were able to recover DNA from this guy who lived around 3000 BC. The point is that it's much easier to recover meaningful data from an ancient human than it is from a phone that's maybe a, a year or two old. And so I did a little digging, and I, I was curious if there's a Canadian Iceman. Turns out he's not quite as old as Utsi, so not quite as impressive. But scientists were able to link relatives in British Columbia to the Canadian Iceman. So he was also found well-preserved. Because DNA really doesn't need any of the, the needs that typical server farms, for example, need. DNA is happy if you just keep it cold and dry in your wine cellar, in your fridge. Uh, or, you know, high up in the Alps or in British Columbia. So how do we actually store data in DNA? It sounds a little wild, but it's actually quite simple. So if we go back to that first ever photo of DNA, 
taken in 1953. We can actually just basically convert that to zeros and ones, or binary digits. Now, before I actually go into the technical details, I just want to draw a bit of a parallel in our understanding of DNA and data storage technology. So, as I mentioned, this photo was published in 1953. And this is the first ever photo of DNA. So we really were still pretty clueless at the time. Just three years later, IBM released the first ever commercial hard drive. This thing, wait for it, held a whopping 3.75 megabytes. That's barely an MP3 song. <laughs> so we've come a long way, as you can see. But I want to give you, before I explain the technical details, I want to give you a bit more of a timeline. Because again, I think it's interesting to note that our understanding of DNA and of storage architecture has sort of co-evolved since the 1950s. So DNA uh, as a storage device is not really a new idea. Some of you may know this guy, Richard Feynman, who's a... Um, a physicist who uh, was working at MIT, and he presented a lecture in 1959 where he was focusing on how we can possibly miniaturize things. He was really obsessed with trying to miniaturize things. But he actually came up with the idea of possibly using DNA to store data. Now, of course, in 1959, he hadn't actually done any of this quite yet, but it was this guy, Mikhail Niemann, who is a Russian physicist, who actually put into detail how we could actually record and store and retrieve information on DNA. And then this guy, who looks like, I think he would have a good time at WAC, uh, he was the first to actually uh, put this into practice. He's the first guy who actually encoded data in DNA. And so this was in 1988. And now this is actually a pretty simple concept. It wasn't uh, anything to scale. But what he did is he took this ancient rune, symbolizing micro-Venus, and he converted that to bits. So he converted the pixels to bits. And then basically he used a simple coding scheme to convert those zeros and ones into a DNA sequence. And then he pasted this into what's known as a vector. Some of you might remember from high school biology. It's just a way that allows you to then insert that DNA into bacteria, for example, E. coli. And so that was the first ever example of encoding data in DNA back in 1988. So just a few years later, this guy, Leonard Adelman, created the first prototype of a DNA computer. And so what he did is he actually used DNA to solve what's known as the traveling salesman problem. Uh, if you're not familiar with this, it's basically just about finding the most uh, efficient route for, for example, a salesman. So from when he leaves his home to all the houses that he visits, and then how he gets back. So the most efficient path. And Adelman also did this with different flight paths among different cities. And so this was the very first DNA computer, um, and he was actually able to implement it to solve this problem. So one very quick overview of more recent advances in DNA storage. So since that 1988 experiment, not, there wasn't a lot done to actually implement data storage in DNA. There was a small experiment in 1999 where scientists encoded the message June 6 invasion Normandy in DNA. Um, and so this was more focused on playing around with encryption, and they actually even sent the DNA on a dot in a letter and were able to recover it. So it wasn't really until 2010 that DNA storage um, showed some advances in actually scaling up the technology. So really, it's only in the last eight or nine years that using DNA as a data storage medium has been put into practice. And as you can see, we've made some really incremental advances. I mean, we started with 0.65 megabytes. And those first two studies, those are uh, some of my colleagues, actually, they were not able to recover the files. And in the first study, uh, they actually used an absurd amount of redundancy, where basically every single DNA letter had multiple copies. And this is really inefficient coding, super expensive, and the guys weren't even able to recover the data. 
So it wasn't looking too promising back in 2012, 2013. Uh, but finally, in 2015, researchers were able to recover a very small amount of data, but without any error. And soon after, they even made a rewritable and random access uh, DNA storage architecture. So it's important to mention that when you store data in DNA, you have to sequence it to get the data back. And so oftentimes, you have to basically just load all of the DNA onto the sequencer and wait a few hours. You don't have to do that, obviously, with man-made storage devices. And so random access has uh, been a huge goal of the DNA storage community because you don't want to have to sequence everything. You want to be able to access specific files. So we are able to do that. Uh, there are certain studies out there that were recently published that allow people to randomly access files. So soon after, uh, we made a huge jump and were able to store 22 megabytes in, in DNA in 2016, so just three years ago. And then our study was published in 2017, and so we were able to encode data error-free at a density of 215 petabytes per gram. And so I'm going to talk mostly about our study to show the, the significant improvements that were made. But mostly, DNA technology has witnessed very, uh, very small improvements. And that's because I want to emphasize that we really haven't focused on actually using DNA as a storage technology. Uh, it's really only in the last few years. And so more recently, the, the record was reached by uh, researchers at the University of Washington at Microsoft, and they encoded 200 megabytes of data and DNA. And I, I didn't actually find the total cost, but it's absurdly expensive. So I'll, I'll show more about the scale of storing data and DNA. But our study of two megabytes cost $7,000 to store. So we're not there yet, except maybe as a novelty item. So now I want to describe how we actually do this. So if I were, again, to take that first photo of DNA, convert it into binary digits, it's actually quite simple to then translate these binary digits into DNA. So you basically take, up, take your file, convert those zeros and ones to A, C, G, and T, so we define which letters are assigned which binary digits. And as scientists, we have this technology to write, store, and read DNA. So we've been able to write DNA since about the 1950s. Uh, Obviously, we can store the DNA. It stores very easily at 4 degrees Celsius. It can last tens to hundreds of years. Or if you go down to minus 20, minus 80, uh, you can last for thousands of years. So maybe, maybe we can store it here. <laughs> it's spring in Paris. Give me a break. <laughs> so we also can read DNA. Uh, this technology is relatively recent. Actually, um, has witnessed an insane advance in uh, cost for sequencing. So it cost about $3 billion to sequence the first human genome in 2001, and now we've gone down to below the $1,000 genome. So it's become incredibly affordable just in the last 15 or so years. And the great thing is, so for this DNA storage technology, we're actually leveraging these existing technologies and it's a $30 billion industry, so we have a lot of technology to work with. Uh, the, the main issue, which I'll mention in a bit, is that writing DNA is super expensive. So for our study of encoding two megabytes, it costs about $2,000 to read or sequence, and about um, six to $7,000 just to write the DNA. So we have, the thing is, we haven't really improved on this technology, this chemistry that was developed in the 1950s. So these are the files that we encoded, totaled, uh, compressed about two uh, megabytes. So this was kind of the fun part of the study, just choosing what files to include. We went with the Calibri operating system. Some of you might be familiar with it. It's the smallest existing operating system. It's actually incredibly powerful and fast. Uh, we included a 1948 paper by Claude Shannon, who is the father of information theory. So give him a little bit of a shout out. We also encoded the Pioneer plaque, which you see on the bottom left. This was included in the Pioneer spacecraft, which was launched in, I think, 1972. And I, the spacecraft is now somewhere lost in space, 
but if it ever encounters extraterrestrials, um, this is supposed to, according to Carl Sagan, uh, explain where we are in the universe and what we look like. So we also included a zip bomb for fun and a $50 Amazon gift card code, <laughs> which has been spent. So, and of course, being a Francophile, I chose to include a video by the Frères Lumière. It was one of the first ever videos uh, to be created, and it's the uh, Arrivée d'Entrain. So, this was the actual tube that we received. So once we converted all of those files into DNA, this is the tube that we received from this company out in California. And this includes all of our data, so all of those files are somewhere in that tube. Now, one pitfall, there are a few, which I will admit, about storing data in DNA is that it's finite. When you access data on a hard drive, you're not taking the data off of the hard drive, you're, you're copying it, you're transferring it. When you sequence DNA, you're essentially destroying the DNA. So every time you want to retrieve data, you take a drop of DNA. It's really just, it looks like a little bit of water in the tube. So every time you need to retrieve your DNA, you have to destroy it. Fortunately, there is a way that we can make essentially unlimited copies. And this technology has existed since the 1980s. It's called PCR, and it allows us to copy DNA. Scientists do it in the lab every single day to make additional copies. And so we actually did a test in our paper because this process introduces a lot of errors. And we ended up copying the data trillions of times through this process. And this is actually a really cheap process. It only costs a few bucks to do a PCR. And so copying the data is basically a non-issue. And so once you actually pay that $7,000 to, to synthesize your DNA, you can essentially make an unlimited library. And so this resulted in many, many possible copies. So, this is the movie that was encoded in DNA. And we actually tested the process. We copied this movie on DNA trillions of times and were able to decode it without any errors. So I can safely say that that was the first ever movie copied trillions of times and stored and recovered on DNA. So a nice hat tip to the Frère Lumière. So once we had our, our data synthesized, we actually uh, submitted the sequencing data to a publicly available database. So actually all of our code is available on GitHub. The sequences are also available on the ENA, the European Nucleotide Archive. And so that being said, you can actually go and access the sequencing data. You can access the it's simple Python code on GitHub. And so here I'm showing retrieval, our decoding process, from the DNA sequences to the actual uh, retrieval of the files. So encoding all of this data took about two and a half minutes uh, using one CPU on a, a MacBook Air. Decoding took a little bit longer, took about nine minutes, so this is obviously sped up a bit. Um, and here we are unzipping the files. And so these are the files that were uh, synthesized and encoded on DNA and then sequenced at our institute. And so here we are having some fun opening the Calibri operating system. So this is the operating system that was stored and retrieved from DNA. As you can see, it has full functionality. We can play Minesweeper. And so we were able, through this first round of experiments, to completely recover all of our data without any issues. And actually, it was a Swiss data scientist who downloaded the data and found the Amazon code. And so he spent the $50 Amazon card on a very nerdy book about emerging intelligence. It's, <laughs> it's, it's fitting. <laughs> so since you guys are tech savvy, um, and a lot of people really want to know kind of the magic behind how we actually do this, obviously there's a bit more to uh, converting zeros and ones to A, T, C, and G. There's a lot of uh, constraints to take into account. So this is the paper we published in 2017. And so some of the advantages of our study are that we, we approach basically the limit of the amount of data you can store per nucleotide. 
so the total number of bits that you can store per A, T, C, or G. And our method is really adaptable, it's highly flexible, and as you can see, robust to experimental noise, we were able to really kick at the, at the data and copy it trillions of times and still recover the data without any error. So for those of you who aren't familiar, just because it's a huge part of um, our advances in our study, I mentioned him a bit earlier, Claude Shannon, the father of information theory. So what we did in our study is we explored the Shannon capacity of DNA storage. So since we have four options per nucleotide, A, T, C, or G, gives us a library of four, meaning we can store up to two bits per nucleotide. The problem is not all DNA is created equal, so there are some constraints we need to take into account. But basically, what Claude Shannon did was he determined, given a certain bandwidth, a certain noise, basically the maximum rate at which data can be transmitted over a communication channel without any error. And so DNA is, for all intents and purposes, a communication channel. So we can think of it in sort of a similar way. So when we're trying to determine the capacity of DNA storage, there's obviously a, a few differences than just transmitting zeros and ones. So one issue is that we don't like to have too many Cs and Gs in our sequence. And again, going back to high school biology, does anyone, actually, does anyone know why? Why Cs and Gs might be an issue? Because there are three hydrogen bonds between them, so sequencing, synthesis, copying, uh, these processes can lead to a lot of errors simply if you have too many Cs and Gs. So there's kind of an ideal window. And so we have to take this into account in our coding strategy. We also don't like what we call homopolymers. These are when you have the same base repeated a certain number of times. So it's been shown that anything more than four repeats of a single A, T, C, or G can lead to dropout of the DNA sequence. And so it will fail to be synthesized, fail to be sequenced, and then you lose your information. So these are things that we have to work with. So once we take those into account, we can realistically store up to 1.98 bits per nucleotide, which is pretty good. The problem is that you'll often get dropout of the data, so we might actually lose some of those sequences. And so really the upper limit for how much data you can store in DNA is about 1.8 bits per nucleotide. So don't be too overwhelmed by this. These are the algorithmic steps of how we actually store data in DNA using a process called fountain codes. So for those of you who aren't familiar, Fountain codes were developed for reliable broadcasting of information over noisy channels like mobile TV. So we thought, well, DNA is pretty noisy. So we, tried to, we decided to implement this in our encoding strategy in converting our, those files, those zeros and ones, back to uh, A, T, C, and G. And the great thing about fountain codes is that you can essentially create an unlimited library an unlimited number of encoded chunks. So you take your original source file, and you can basically chop it up and package it in an unlimited fashion. And what this allows us to do for DNA is that we can essentially throw out sequences that are not very interesting or that don't, um, basically that don't meet those constraints that I mentioned. So we can generate the sequence, and if they have too many Cs and Gs or too many single letters in a row, we can simply throw them away. And the fountain code lets us basically create a limitless library. So the first step of actually storing the data in DNA, if we take a very simple example of a binary file, we essentially just segment this file into a predetermined size. Um, and basically, some of the pre-processing steps really just require us to tar zip the files. Once we tar zip those files, we move on to the step called creating droplets. And so this is where the whole fountain encoding scheme comes in. So again, we just break up that file. Don't try too hard to follow the zeros and ones. It's just to give you an idea of what goes into the fountain code. And so once we have our file represented here by this matrix, we multiply that by a sparse vector, and that gives us a single droplet. Now we can create limitless droplets, as I mentioned. And so here you see, after this operation, we can just keep repeating this operation and generate as many droplets as we want.
And so then we move on to the screening stage. We can, um, we basically perform a few operations. We add some redundancy, um, and we encode the data, and then convert those zeros and ones to A's, T's, C's, and G's. And as I mentioned, the great thing is that being able to use this rateless code, which allows us to generate an unlimited number of droplets, means that we can see if they pass our biochemical constraints, and if not, we simply throw away the DNA sequence, and we don't send it to the file. Now, once we do have the DNA sequences, we can send it to a file, and then we just send that, up, uh, send that off to a DNA synthesis company. And then they send you back that tube for the small price of $7,000. And so that's the easy part, really, converting those zeros and ones to A's, T's, C's, and G's. But the huge advantage was the use of the fountain code, which gave us huge flexibility for how much data we could store. So I've shown you how we can actually convert a file to DNA that we can write, we can store, we can read, that it's kind of ridiculously expensive, definitely can't compete with any man-made technology for the cost. No one would be willing to pay for this price tag of storing data in DNA at 7,000 for two megabytes. But the thing is, with our study, we found that you could actually reach a total of 215 petabytes in a single gram of DNA. It's a lot of data. So if we go back to that original scale for how much digital data there currently is, if we split the difference between 2019 and 2020, we say we have 35 uh, zettabytes. All of the world's data could fit into 160 kilograms of DNA. Now, to give you an idea, that would be about 30 <laughs> bottles of maple syrup. I, I thought this was a relevant example, not just because of the maple syrup, who doesn't love maple syrup, but I found out that apparently there is a legal weight that uh, maple syrup has to weigh, and that's about five kilograms. So, 30, 30 bottles of maple syrup to store all the world's DNA. Not too bad. And since there seems to be um, a fondness for dashens, this would be an equivalent weight of 16 dashens to store all of the world's data in DNA. So, as I mentioned, DNA can't really compete with man-made storage devices. But it is unrivaled in density. It would require... Now, these are two of the top of the line. I wasn't cheating. These are really top of the line storage media. We have a 100 terabyte flash drive, but it would require 350,000 of them to store those 30 bottles of maple syrup worth of data. And IBM, I think a year or two ago, uh, developed a 330 terabyte tape cartridge. So we'd only need about 100,000 of them. Still, this is not even close to the density we can reach with DNA. Now, <laughs> There's another uh, device that was um, a sort of more miniaturized version, which is kind of on par with DNA, because, again, we can, we can store data in minute spaces. But this thing has a ridiculous price tag just for storing two terabytes. So, as you can see, DNA can really outcompete in terms of storage density. So, DNA, we can store 215 petabytes in a single gram. But the thing is, these devices last five, maybe ten years. DNA can last hundreds to thousands of years. So obviously, if you're interested in storing you know, your music or photos, DNA is not the solution. But if we want to store data that's required to keep humanity moving forward, for example, all scientific publications, uh, anything stored in a library, DNA is the, really the ideal storage architecture. You write it, you leave it somewhere cold and dry, and it's, it's completely safe. And it's much less ten temperature sensitive than any of these man-made devices. Basically, as long as you keep it below 70 Celsius, it's pretty happy. So, really the only main competitor for DNA would be magnetic tape. Google actually still stores all of their backups on magnetic tape. It's still the most reliable man-made uh, technology. The problem is it only lasts 10, maybe up to 30 years. And as I showed you with those film archivists, they're really struggling to keep up with the advances of technology. 
because man-made devices become obsolete, and our way to read them becomes obsolete along with the technology. The problem is that reading data off of tapes can take seconds or minutes, and when it comes to DNA, it takes hours to sequence. And in order to synthesize the DNA, to write your data in DNA, it can take days. So no one's really waiting, willing to wait that much time. But there is、uh, a similar solution. Some of you might have heard of Amazon Glacier, which actually has this price、uh, markup where if you don't access your data, it's quite cheap to store. Once you want to access the data, you have to pay quite a lot. So we think DNA could have a sort of similar pay-to-access、um, once it actually is. Is in the market and becomes a viable option. And as I mentioned, the the price tag, optimistically, we can maybe encode data at ten thousand dollars a gigabyte. So again, still kind of a novelty item. So the storage of digital data over long time frames is really challenging, even when it comes to man-made devices. And this graph is actually very optimistic.、Uh, maybe by 2030, we will able, be able to beat the cost per gigabyte of magnetic-based storage.、Um, maybe more、uh, pessimistically, but realistically, by 2050, we might be able to outcompete magnetic tape. But this again is based on research that we've only done in maybe the last 10 or so years. So DNA sequencing has surpassed Moore's law. It has decreased exponentially since the first sequence of the human genome in 2001. So right here we're we're down to below the $1,000 genome, and so sequencing has become basically a non-issue. It's hardly even a bottleneck for data storage in DNA. The main issue is writing, and as I mentioned, this is a technique that was developed in the 1950s. It's this old Chemical technique that companies still use today, but just recently scientists are working on actually going back to nature, as we did with storing data in DNA, and they're using enzyme-based synthesis, which is much cheaper, much better for the environment. So I'm very confident that we will be able to synthesize DNA at a much more reasonable rate than seven thousand dollars. So we've come a really long way in man-made storage devices. That again is in 1956, and here we are today. We can store 200 gigabytes on the head of a, a quarter, a Canadian quarter. <laughs> I made sure to change it. <laughs> and as I mentioned, our our knowledge of DNA and of data storage have sort of co-evolved. So we've reached similar miniaturization with a sequencer in、um, in the last 15 years. And so this is a portable sequencer. And it's actually been used in a lot of studies recently because it allows you to do what's called read until. Basically, instead of taking your DNA and sequencing it and waiting hours, you can read your files in real time. So we can randomly access data in real time from DNA. So in 60 years, we've learned a lot about how to read, write, and edit and copy DNA. We can even edit it now. And obviously, in that same time frame, man-made storage devices have made a lot more progress. But again, we haven't really focused on how to store data in DNA, except in the last 10 years. So give us give us the equivalent time frame, maybe 20, 30 more years, and I think DNA will become a really viable option, at least for, as I mentioned, storing things that are important for keeping humanity going. So man-made devices have. Really become、uh, unbelievable in their storage density, nowhere near DNA as I showed you. But the exponential growth in real life can't last forever. And the thing is, DNA is incredibly dense. But more importantly, it will never become obsolete, like all of these man-made storage devices. As long as we're around, there will be DNA. And if we are not interested in still being able to sequence DNA, then we have a lot more problems than worrying about data storage. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci à vous. À part le français, vous l'avez pas dit.、Hein? Um... <laughs> Non, mais c'est vrai, elle étudie à Paris. Euh, <rire> euh, on y va avec une、euh, série question-réponse. Ça commence déjà de ce côté-ci. Pardonnez-moi.
Yeah, hi. Uh, I have a question, actually. It's a bit, I know we are decades before we can actually stick a Petri dish in a DVD re reader, but uh, uh, do you think that, and I think what I'm about to ask is beyond science fiction, but uh, there could be, because DNA is the basis of life, of all genetic material, and uh, could it be that someday there is a, a ethical problem to whether or not our servers are alive because they're made of, I don't know, flesh and bones. It has a very H.G. Geiger look to it in my mind, but uh, yeah, could it, could it be a, an issue one, one day, do you so think? So we, we actually have thought about this, and if you apply for grants for DNA storage, they make sure that you have something in place to check what data is actually being coded. So yes, people can encode viruses, they can actually encode DNA for literal viruses. Uh, so there, there are things that we can do to put in place to check that there are no harmful sequences. Right. Uh, but people, researchers have shown that they were able to actually uh, hack into DNA sequencers, mostly because the passwords are usually one, two, three. Um, and so in this case, it could definitely be an issue because your data would be very vulnerable. Right. So it's not science fiction. It's something we think about as we're developing the technology. Okay, now, now I'm scared. <laughs> <laughs> Et que quelqu'un d'autre aurait une question à poser. Oui, de l'autre côté. Uh, Besides, um, like you talk about, a lot about the, the hardware problem of uh, retrieving that and storing data for a long time. But what about the, uh, do, do you know of any research about the software side of things? Like if you encode a video in DNA, when you decode it, you have bits. But how do you, uh, if the software doesn't exist anymore, what we will do in... in uh, yeah, so there, there have been a lot of software improvements. And um, apart from those studies where they weren't able to recover the data with no error, uh, we all use error correcting codes. And so that's um, basically uh, a given. Most, most studies won't even encode data unless there's error correcting codes. Thank you. Est-ce que quelqu'un d'autre aurait une question à poser de l'autre côté? Hey, t'aurais pas pu lever ta main tantôt, toi. Tu me fais travailler, là. J'ai mal aux jambes. Hi. Um, I think you said that all your research is open source right now. Um, so, can you tell us, like, what you're working on right now and uh, what you're aiming to achieve in the next, let's say, year or two? So you want my five-year plan? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> so I'm actually not currently working on DNA storage. Uh, we recently applied for a grant from the U.S. government, and we didn't get it. And the truth is, the technology is really quite young. Uh, I have no doubt that we'll be storing our data in DNA, but I think it's going to take 10, 20, really 30 years until it's on the market. I mean, we've done it. We can store data in DNA but to actually compete with Uh, man-made devices is going to take, I think, probably 30 years. Uh, but me, I'm working on um, basically analyzing cancer data. The Institut Curie is a cancer research institute, so that's my day job. And I still like to talk about this and explore the possibility of uh, getting back into the field. Est-ce qu'il y a une autre question dans la salle? Moi, j'ai une question. I have a question. Okay, uh, maybe I'm, I'm too much an enthusiast, but will it be possible to change the DNA of someone growing in the belly of her mom? Yes, mom? we can do that. There's this technology called CRISPR. So uh, we can actually edit DNA now. Um, there are a lot of ethical concerns, uh, but there actually has been an, an edited human that has been born. So they actually edited out the HIV risk from this baby, and most scientists were not happy. This was done in China, and it was against ethical regulation. Uh, but yes, we have the means to edit DNA, ideally for terrible genetic disorders, but it's something that is being done very cautiously. And we pretend that one day we will know what is the genetic code of racism and bigotry and just get rid of it. The, sorry, the code of what? <laughs> Uh, if, if we can find the, the DNA code for uh, racism and bigotry and... Well, we kind of already have just... the power of scientific truth and population geneticists have shown that there's no such thing as race. So, there you go. Science. 
<rire> we'll do it. <rire> oh, on a une question ou c'est terminé? C'est une question? Question, question. Yes, what, what about forgetting about uh, file formats, like a BMP picture? <laughs> Nobody used that today, and probably and within the next 10 years, software won't read that. Sorry, which picture? Yeah, BMP. BMP. Hey, wow, <laughs> she doesn't even know. Oh, uh, BMP, yeah, yes. bitmap, <laughs> yes. <laughs> No format. Uh, no, nobody yeah, uses yeah. that today. <laughs> Absolutely. There's many obsolete formats, devices, and the turnover of man-made storage is absurd. DNA hasn't changed in billions of years, so it's reliable in that respect. Yeah, you, you need the software. <laughs> yeah, of course you need the software. You always need the software. Uh, you'll write new software, but there'll always be DNA. Une autre question? Oui. Non, peut-être. Oui, une autre question. Je t'envoie ça, t'es prêt? Ouf. <laughs> so, question. You said that a lot of data can fit into 160 kilograms of, of maple syrup. Um, <laughs> is the data div divisible? Like, can you divide data? Or can you, if you get a drop, you, you get half the movie? Or how, how, how does that yeah, work? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. If you don't have all of... I mean... If you have a drop, chances are you would recover all of your data. It's, there's many copies of a DNA sequence in a single drop, so there's a lot of redundancy there. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of um, actually recovering the data, yeah, you can parse it into multiple tubes. So that would obviously have a bigger storage fo uh, footprint mm -hmm. if you store them in little tubes, but still uh, very manageable, much smaller than uh, the space needed for any of those tapes or flash drives. Thank you. On va y aller avec une dernière question pour s'assurer que vous ne soyez pas en retard à vos conférences. Est-ce qu'il y aurait une dernière question? Oui, non, peut-être. Je ne sais pas. It's over. It's done. We're okay. done. Thank you. Thank Merci you beaucoup. Very much. Merci tout le monde. Soyez euh, prudents dans les corridors. On ne court pas autour de la piscine. À tantôt. On se revoit dans deux conférences pour la finale de Génie en web.